Dr. Ray Steadman in his book, God's Blueprint for Success, Wisdom from the Book of Nehemiah, uh, writes in regards to Nehemiah chapter 9, said, Dwight L. Moody was a great American evangelist and the founder of the Moody Church and Moody Bible Institute in Chicago. As pastor at the Moody Church, he once asked a Christian brother to pray during a worship service. The man rose to his feet, turned his face toward heaven, and began to pray, and pray, and pray. <laughs> and ten minutes later, he was still praying. And Mr. Moody and his congregation were growing restless. And finally, Mr. Moody stood up and announced, while our dear brother continues his prayer, let's turn to him, number 342, and sing together. So while God never tires of hearing us pray, people sometimes do. By contrast, there's the story of Bobby Richardson, an outspoken Christian and former New York Yankee second baseman. By the way, Jim Tressel, former Ohio State coach at Fellowship of Christian Athletes Camp, accepted the Lord after Bobby Robertson of the New York Yankees was giving his testimony. And he challenged the people of, do you know that you would go to heaven? And uh, Jim Tressel, after hearing Bobby Robertson give the testimony and the challenge that night, received the Lord Jesus Christ as a Savior Lord. He once offered a prayer at a fellowship of Christian athletes meeting, and that prayer managed to be both amazingly brief and quite profound. Dear Lord, your will, nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. Amen. Amen. <laughs> so when it comes to prayer, that's the long and the short of it. Here in Nehemiah 9, Nehemiah records the longest prayer in the entire Bible. And it says, um, Nehemiah records for us here a great model of prayer that will teach us several profound lessons and how to have a meaningful conversation with God. We're going to start out, first of all, the greatness of God. The greatness. Verses 1 through 6, first of all, he receives our worship. The Bible says, now on the 24th day of this month, that was the seventh month, the sons of Israel assembled with fasting in sackcloth and with dirt upon them. The descendants of Israel separated themselves from all foreigners and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. While they stood in their place, they read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for a fourth of the day, and for another fourth they confessed and worshipped the Lord their God. Now on the Levites' platform stood Jeshua, Bani, Kadmiel, Shebaniah, Bunai, Sherebiah, Bani, and Shenani, and they cried with a loud voice to the Lord their God. Then the Levites, Jeshua, Kadmiel, Bani, Hashbanani, Sherebiah, Hodiah, Shebaniah, and Pethiah said, Arise, bless the Lord your God forever and ever. O oh, may your glorious name be blessed and exalted above all blessing and praise. He receives our worship. So we see how they came. They had been fasting and mourning. They're confessing their sins. Remember, it's been a long time, or some of them have never heard the law of the Lord. They've never heard. And when the word was read, they said, wait a second. Look how we have turned away from Almighty God. Look how we're not, how we're not obeying. We're disobeying the commands of the word of God. And so there was fasting. They humbled themselves before the Lord. They're hearing the word. They're confessing their sins to the Lord. They have humbled themselves. They have made themselves low. The idea of humble, humility, of coming low before the Lord. With fasting and mourning, they read from the book of the law of the Lord for three hours. And then for another three hours, they confessed and worshiped the Lord. 
That sounds a lot like 2 Corinthians, or not 2 Corinthians, I'm sorry, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. That if my people that are called by my name will humble themselves, make low before God, humble themselves, pray, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and heal their land. So they are really following the pattern of 2 Chronicles 7.14, aren't they? they are hum they're humbling themselves before the Lord. They're hearing the word. Now worship is based upon truth. Remember Jesus said in John 4, those who worship Him would worship Him in spirit and in truth. That's based upon the word of God. For good biblical worship, it's based upon the Scripture. It's based what the Scripture says. There's a lot of uh, that is called worship that isn't scriptural based. It's not biblical based. You know, it's, it's popular today. There may be even invitations given people to receive Christ. But if there's not the proclamation, the preaching of God's Word, what's that based upon? <laughs> And so what we have is the importance of the Scripture. Wearsby noted that worship involves the Word of God, for the Word of God reveals the God of the Word. We know about God from His Word. What is revealed in the Scripture, the essence, A.W. Tozer wrote, the essence of idolatry, he wrote in the knowledge of the holy is the entertainment of thoughts about God that are unworthy of Him. The idea of idolatry is replacing God. Replacing God with something else. And so Tozer's right. But as we look at verse 6 of Nehemiah chapter 9, it says, You alone are the Lord. He is God alone. There are no other. You alone are the Lord, the great I am. He created the universe. You have made the heavens, the heaven of heavens with all their host. Isn't it amazing that scientists are discovering new things today? Astronomers, you know, are finding out new things. There's even, they're discovering new galaxies. They're discovering all these various things. It's part of God's creation. God has made, He has created. You have made the heavens, the heaven of heavens, with all their host. And then His providential care for His creation. You know, the deists, uh, at the time of the founding of our countries, those that were deists, kind of compared to God to, you know, setting the alarm clock and winding up the, the clock and just setting it on it for its own. But that's not the scriptural truth. He sustains His creation. As He not only created, and He didn't create and didn't just say, oh, okay, off to your home. No, but He sustains creation. And so, His providential care. He said, the seas and all that is in them, you give life to all of them, and the heavenly host bows down before you. Host of heaven, worship Him. So we start with the greatness of God. Then we look at the goodness of God. We'll say, that we have that statement, God is great. He is so far above us. His power, His actions, His work, His creative work. But He is also good. When we think about the goodness of God, we're talking about His mercy. I am so thankful that God doesn't give me what I deserve. God is merciful. And we're going to see recounted here in Nehemiah chapter 9 reasons for God's goodness. Because did the children of Israel always obey the Lord? No. In fact, many times they were transgressing against God and rebelling against Him. They were faithless, but He remains faithful. God keeps His covenants. 
When we think about how God operates and you look at the covenants that's within the scriptures, you look at the Abrahamic covenant that God said, even from Abraham, there's going to be a seed that was going to be Jesus Christ, as Paul writes in Galatians 3, that Christ, the seed of Abraham, that's why Matthew will say, Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, in the lineage, the descendant of. But you have the eternal covenant that God made with Abraham, and that involves the land covenant, the land that was promised to, through Abraham to the descendants, reiterated to Isaac, reiterated to Jacob, the patriarchs. This is the land. That's why when we hear on the news and sometimes these protests and, and trying to say that the Jews are occupiers. No, biblically, that's their land. God gave it to them. And, and they talk about occupiers. No, you go back all the way in the scripture, what God said clear to Abraham. And all this is taking place. All oh, the Abrahamic covenant. God forming a nation. The Davidic covenant, the fact that Jesus Christ will reign. You talk about, even as the Lord said to David, there will be one of your descendants who will reign forever. He wasn't talking about Solomon. He was talking about the Lord Jesus Christ who will reign. Ah, oh, we have the precious new covenant. The new covenant that Jesus Christ in his own precious blood, Lord willing, in a couple Sundays, when we partake of the Lord's Supper together, I believe the Lord is leading to, to preach on the new covenant from Hebrews chapter 8. And we'll focus on uh, more on that uh, message in, on Sunday morning on the, uh, about the 24th. And when we would partake of uh, communion together, and when we talk about the new covenant, what is the new covenant? And we'll look more into that. So we think about the goodness of God forming the nation. Begin verse 7. You are the Lord God who chose Abram and brought him out from Ur of the Chaldees and gave him the name Abraham, went from exalted father to father of many nations. You gave him that name, and you found his heart faithful before you, and made a covenant with him to give him the land of the Canaanite, of the Hittite, the Amorite, the Perizzite, the Jebusite, the Girgashite. Those are the Ite brothers, <laughs> the descendants, all that, that had the land. To give it to his descendants, and you have fulfilled your promise, for you are righteous. When we think about how God was using, he chose Abraham. We're told in the scriptures that Abraham's father was an idolater as they worshiped many gods and how God had taken him from Ur of the Chaldees and then in Haran and next thing you know, he ends up in uh, obedience to the Lord. He wasn't perfect, was he? No, there was times of where Abraham didn't walk by faith. <laughs> even though he's a great man of faith, forming the nation. God's covenant was the basis for all that God did with and for Abraham and his descendants. It was God's purpose that all the world be blessed through Israel. And he did this in the sending of his son, Jesus Christ. God gave the land to Abraham and his descendants, even though during his lifetime, Abraham owned nothing in the land. You know what he did? He lived in tents. Abraham never built a house in the land that was promised. He had many animals, didn't he? He had many servants. He was a very wealthy man, but he didn't settle down in one area. He lived in tents, and he would go in the various parts of the land that God promised him. Then we see Continuing on in verse 9, the Bible says, You saw the affliction of our fathers in Egypt. You heard their cry by the Red Sea. You performed signs and wonders against Pharaoh and against all his servants and all the people of his land. For you knew that they acted arrogantly toward them and made a name for yourself as it is this day. You divided the sea before them, so they passed through the midst of the sea on dry ground. 
and their pursuers you hurled unto the depths like a stone into raging waters. And with a pillar of cloud you led them by day, and with a pillar of fire by night, to light for them the way in which they were to go. So this was really Exodus chapter 1 through 15, how God was leading them out of bondage, the children of Israel out of Egypt, for they had spent those 430 years in bondage. But even in the midst of that, what happened to their numbers? They multiplied greatly. They grew. The forming of the nation. This is what God was doing. This is how God was working. And then even as he brought them out, we're told they came down on Mount Sinai and spoke with them from heaven. You gave them just ordinances and true laws, good statutes and commandments. So you made known to them your holy Sabbath and laid down for them commandments, statutes and law through your servant Moses. You provided bread from heaven for them for their hunger. You brought forth water from a rock for them for their thirst. You told them to enter in order to possess the land which you swore to give to them. So the Lord's been faithful, hadn't he? He's led them. Now they're to go into the land that God says, I have given you the land. You are to go and obey me. But what's happening? Ten of the witnesses come back and say, we can't defeat them. There's giants in the land. We're like grasshoppers in their sight. I always think about this. There were ten that gave the bad report and two that gave the good. Now I have trouble remembering all those ten that were bad a spy that went into the land that came back with a bad report, but I can remember the two that were good. They're only the two of that generation that's going to go into the promised land. Caleb and Joshua. That's exactly right. Caleb and Joshua are the two that are good. We, we can remember them, can't we? <laughs> but the ten that gave the bad said, we can't defeat them. Now who did the children of Israel listen to? The ten that were bad. They said, oh, we, we'll be defeated. We'll die trying to conquer. And even though Caleb and Joshua said, let's go because the Lord has given us the land. He will be with us. He will empower us and we'll go in. But they didn't obey. They wouldn't go. In verse 16, but they, our fathers, acted arrogantly. They became stubborn and would not listen to your commandments. They refused to listen and did not remember your wondrous deeds, which you had performed among them. So they became stubborn and appointed a leader to return to their, sla their slavery in Egypt. Remember? They said, even let's arise a leader that takes us back into slavery in Egypt. But you are a God of forgiveness, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness. All those descriptions are what make what we would say the goodness of God. And you did not forsake them. Even when they made for themselves a calf of molten metal and said, This is your God who brought you up from Egypt and committed great blasphemies. Rears be noted, how could these people turn their backs on God after all He had done for them? Their obedience was only an outward form. It didn't come from their hearts. They weren't obedient. They were trying to walk by sight instead of walking by trusting in the Lord, by faith in Him. Point B, leading the nation. Verses 19 through 21, part of this prayer. You, in your great compassion, did not forsake them in the wilderness. The pillar of cloud did not leave them by day to guide them on their way, nor the pillar of fire by night to light for them the way in which they were to go. You gave your good spirit to instruct them. Your manna you did not withhold from their mouth. 
and you gave them water for their thirst. Indeed, 40 years you provided for them in the wilderness, and they were not in want. Their clothes did not wear out, nor did their feet swell. Isn't that amazing? Their clothes did not wear out in those journeys in the wilderness. Leading the nation. Ray Stedman wrote, he doesn't want us to put our trust in material things. He wants us to put our trust in him alone. Relying upon him. So we've seen forming the nation and leading the nation. Now there's expanding the nation. In verse 22, you gave them kingdoms and peoples and allowed them to, to them as a boundary. They took possession of the land of Sihon, the king of Heshbon, and the land of Og, the king of Bashan. You made their sons numerous as the stars of heaven. You brought them into the land which you had told their fathers to enter and possess. This reminds us of the Old Testament book of Joshua as they're going to cross and enter into the land that God has given them. You brought them into the land which you told their fathers to enter and possess. Their sons entered and possessed the land. You subdued before them the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, you gave them into their hand with their kings and the peoples of the land to do with them as they desired. They captured fortified cities and a fertile land. They took possession of houses full of every good thing, hewn cisterns and vineyards, olive groves, fruit trees in abundance. So they ate, were filled, and grew fat, and reveled in your great goodness. Look how the Lord was providing as He expanded the nation. As they're going into the land and, and they're taking what God is giving them. But God is going to have to have here the chastening of the nation. The disciplining of the people. Verses 26 to 31. But they became disobedient and rebelled against you. Cast your law behind their backs and killed your prophets who had admonished them. So that they might return to you and they committed great blasphemies. Therefore you delivered them into the hand of the oppressors who oppressed them. But when they cried to you in the time of their distress, you heard from heaven, and according to your great compassion you gave them deliverers who delivered them from the hand of their oppressors. That reminds us of the Old Testament book of Judges. Remember, uh, it's kind of a cycle. They had turned away from the Lord and they started worshiping other gods. And so God would rise up a people that would take His children of Israel as captives. They're under the dominion, the captivity of a nation. In the midst of that, they cry out to God, Lord, help us. Deliver us. And God would raise up a judge or a, like a warrior, a deliverer. And He would deliver the people of the children of Israel from the bondage. And then for a while they would be okay, and then the next thing you know, in prosperity, what happens? They would go right back to worshiping these other gods, and worship these idols. They would turn away from the Lord. They would be disobedient. And so then God would allow them to go back into captivity, and then they would cry out again and say, Lord, help us. And He would raise up another deliverer. You can see that cycle in the book of Judges over and over again. And then that continued on in the history. Even as God would send the prophets to him and say, repent, turn back to me, leave this idolatry. And eventually in 722, the northern tribes would be carried away into captivity, the Assyrian captivity. 605 B.C., it begins the Babylonian captivity. 586 B.C., the temple is going to be destroyed and Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. And so you have in the midst of captivity because of disobedience to God... So in these verses, it says in verse 28, As soon as they had rest, they did evil again before you. Therefore you abandoned them to the hand of their enemies, so that they ruled over them. And when they cried again to you, you heard from heaven. And many times you rescued them according to your compassion, and admonished them in order to turn them back to your law. Yet they acted arrogantly and did not listen to your commandments but sinned against your ordinances, by which if a man observes them, he shall live. And they turned a stubborn shoulder and stiffened their neck and would not listen. 
However, you bore with them for many years and admonished them by your spirit through your prophets, yet they would not give ear. Therefore you gave them into the hand of the peoples of the lands. Nevertheless, in your great compassion, you did not make an end of them or forsake them, for you are a gracious and compassionate God. They're saying, look at us. We're, we're the remnant that has come back from captivity. We are back here in Jerusalem. You have been so good, you allowed us to build, rebuild the wall. But here we are. And they look at the history and say, look how we have forsaken you. But you have never stopped being compassionate and forgiving and how gracious you are. That leads us to the grace of God. This last paragraph of this passage, verses 32 to 37. In verse 32, you see the praise to God. Now therefore our God, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God, who keeps covenant and loving kindness. Even though we were faithless, even though we departed from you, you have not forgotten your covenant that was made. You have kept your word. Do not let all the hardship seem insignificant before you, which has come upon us, our kings, our princes, our priests, our prophets, our fathers, and on all your people from the days of the kings of Assyria to this day. However, you are just in all that has come upon us, for you have dealt faithfully, but we have acted wickedly. For our kings, our leaders, our priests, and our fathers have not kept your law or paid attention to your commandments and your admonitions with which you have admonished them. But they in their own kingdom, with your great goodness which you gave them, with the broad and rich land which you set before them, did not serve you or turn from their evil deeds. Behold, we are slaves today. We're back in the land, but guess what? We have to pay taxes to the king. We have to pay taxes to a foreign king because we're slaves in the land. We farm the land, but we have to give a portion to the king because we have, we're back here, but we're still under the authority of another. We have to pay the tax to the king, King Artaxerxes who has allowed Nehemiah to come back. But we're slaves today, and so to the, as the land which you gave to our fathers to eat of its fruit and its bounty, behold, we're slaves in it. Its abundant produce is for the kings whom you have set over us because of our sins. They also rule over our bodies and over our cattle as they please. So we are in great distress. They are confessing their sins to God. They said, this is what we're guilty of. We are very well aware you have been gracious to us that we even have a remnant, that we're even back here in Jerusalem. But we're also very aware that we're actually slaves in the land. That nothing truly is belonging to us. It, the king can take all that he wants. If he wants to raise the taxes, he can do it. That he has the authority. And that we are our slaves to him in a sense. But you have been good to us. We have been very act we've acted wickedly. So they have been faithful to confess sins, haven't they? So as they are hearing the word of the Lord, there's a recognition. How far have we went from what God's word says? They humbled themselves. They were mourning over their sins. They recounted not only the sins of the fathers, but their own sins. So in this longest prayer in the Bible, in Nehemiah chapter 9, you see a recounting of the history in prayer, but you also see a recognition of God's goodness. And they're aware and saying, you know what? You have given us so much more than what we deserve. You have been so good to us. You have been faithful. Even when we have been faithless, you remain faithful. And how great and awesome are you, God. 
and we recognize your goodness. Oh, truly it is amazing grace. Oh God, you have been so faithful. Even though we have been disobedient, that you have given us so many things, oh, that we truly do not deserve. But he's been merciful and you haven't given us what we really do deserve. They recognize this. I really think in Nehemiah chapter 9, also we see prayer here, but I think we see evidence of true revival. And that what's going to happen as a result of turning to Him in humility and, and calling out to God and saying, we have been guilty of sin. Not just in the past, but in the present. And as we continue next time, we're going to see what's going to come as a result of that. The recognition, hey, we have disobeyed the word of God. And that there have been those that have intermarried the pagans even in this land. They have truly disobeyed even what you said and even what Ezra had reiterated before. And there's been disobedience by the people, by the leaders of the people. And we're going to see more about that next time. So we think about it, God's amazing grace the application, the greatness of God, He deserves our worship. The goodness of God, all that He has done and what He continues to do, His great mercy, His faithfulness to us. Oh, the grace of God. Oh, how amazing. How amazing. In the New Testament, we think about the precious truth because Jesus Christ died for us that we have forgiveness of sins, forgiven, and that we can share that glorious message. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we do think about your wondrous grace, oh Lord, help us not to keep that glorious message to ourselves. Oh, but we, to be your witnesses, you empower us to be your witnesses because you have given us the Holy Spirit. We don't go out in our own power. We don't go out in our own abilities. But we are needy and we are reliant upon the work of the Holy Spirit as he lives in us and he would work through us. And as the Spirit empowers us to be your witnesses. Oh, to proclaim your goodness. And Lord, even this week, as you give us those opportunities, may we be faithful. May we speak forth. May we be your ambassadors. May we be your ministers of reconciliation. You've given us the message of reconciliation, Lord. And even as you said in 2 Corinthians 5, Lord, that you would speak through us. And you are pleading with the one we're speaking to to be reconciled to you. Oh, to be faithful witnesses. Oh, as we look tonight in Nehemiah chapter 9, a prayer recording of all your faithfulness even when the children of Israel would be disobedient and how you lovingly reproved them but you didn't forget them and there was still a remnant that came back to Jerusalem. Help us in our prayer time, help us to, to focus on what your word says and how it reveals you that we would spend time communing with you, Lord, for you are worthy. We love you and praise you, we ask as we leave here tonight and we enter into a mission field. May we be faithful missionaries for you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.